Gavin had been working at EA since he was like, uh, like 17 or I don't even know if it was legal. Uh, he started in like QA um, and had worked on games since like Yuri's Revenge and General. So he's, he was a veteran on this team despite his young age. Um, but yeah, they, they are good dudes. Um, we had we had good times over there. Um, you know, this was a this is a great team. They were making like highly rated, multi million selling real time strategy games on basically like a yearly basis. These games had about a year of development time each. Uh, and you know, our dream over there was always like maybe one day we'll be able to have a little bit more time, so maybe we could work on something at the level of like a Company of Heroes or a StarCraft II or whatever. That was our dream, and it was fun to think about the future. And we we had uh, we had our high hopes. Um, but as it happens, uh, you know, the, the future can be unpredictable, uh, both at EA and at other places. And uh, one day, um, the guy who was our uh, beloved executive producer got promoted to the general manager of the studio, and there was much rejoicing. But uh, not very long after that, he actually left uh, the company altogether, um, and he went to a company called Zynga, which at the time no one had ever heard of. Uh, it was kind of interesting. Um, uh, as for the rest of us, uh, we got moved to, like, the uh, the semi-aborted, rebooted uh, Steven Spielberg project, which was pretty surreal. We're like people making real-time strategy games, so that, um, that, that did not really go so well. So we were at a point where we're like, okay, what's going on here? Um, I got very anxious at this point because uh, I had continued to commute um, from Northern California and, it, uh, and I felt like my work wasn't really going anywhere. Um, to keep myself sane, I was playing, um, yeah, they're showing up. I had uh, been, you know, I'd always played a lot of games. I was playing a lot of Street Fighter 4, but I was always, uh, I was also playing games like these um, that were made by like really small teams in comparison to the team that I was on. And it was just kind of mind boggling to me that really small groups of people could make games that were so good and, and felt you, you know, really personal and, and meaningful in comparison to these. I, so, you know, I think I think games like that really planted the seed for us. Um, and uh, we started thinking about how would we do things if we did things on our own, you know, if if, if people weren't moving us around like, like chess people, or I shouldn't even uh, use a chess piece analogy because chess requires strategy, but um, if we were being moved around like a, you know, what, what would we do if we could just do whatever uh, we wanted? Um, so in August of 2009, Amir, Gavin, and I all quit EA like a week or two apart. Um, and here uh, we had a lot of uh, formative discussions about what we would do, like the kind of work environment, um, the kind of studio environment we'd like to be in, you know, a lot of pie in the sky ideas about the kind of games we would make if we could. Um, and uh, Amir and Gavin soon decided that they're, they're like going to do it. Now, um, if you're in this room, uh, I, hopefully you've played Bastion, but if not, I'm about to spoil it for you. Um, near the end of the game, there uh, is a moment of choice that comes up, I think, rather suddenly. Um, it's, uh, I think, a difficult choice um, because there isn't a right answer. Um, and I think interesting choices are those types of choices um, where you, you make you know, either a rational decision or, or an emotional decision or maybe a little of each, and, and you move forward with that. Um, and uh, this was uh, such a moment for me. Um, and, and even though Bastion is a game that's very much about like overcoming regret and, and not looking back at the choices that you make, uh, nevertheless, uh, I made a choice that, that I, I look back on um, quite a bit, um, which was that uh, my, you know, my path ended up diverging from Amir's and Gavin's at that point, um, uh, again, because uh, I'd been uh, commuting to LA for a while. Uh, I was uh, fearing for you know everything from my marriage to my mental health at that moment, and and I felt like I I maybe reached a point in my life where I could not take the kind of risk that these guys were about to take. Um, I had to just kind of go home and uh, be with my family and sort everything else out uh, after that. Uh, ideally, I would find a way to stay in the game industry uh, while maintaining some level of self-respect and just kind of sort things out. Luckily for me. Uh, I was able to get a job um, at 2K Games uh, working on a game called Spec Ops The Line um, that, that was a, a, ha, has its own interesting stories around it. Um, I was a big fan of 2K um, and I ended up working there for a year. Um, meanwhile, um, in the fall of 2009, Amir and Gavin were here, uh, the living room of a house in San Jose, California, and they started working on 
this action RPG where you build the world around you, and it was tentatively called Bastion. Um, this man uh, is the owner of the house. Uh, he's also Mir's father. He's kind of this awesome uh, world traveler dude at this point. Uh, he has his own uh, very interesting past. And the advice he gave to Amir at the time uh, was, was basically, uh, you should start a company now because if you fail, you could go right back to the workforce and it's not gonna kind of matter too much. You know, you'll, you'll be out a bunch of money, but you'll still have most of your life ahead of you. Um, he, he was, uh, in, in other words, very encouraging of his son at that moment, and, um, and that, that was uh, very fortunate. Um, the home, you know, being able to work where they lived um, meant, it was, it was, I think, just necessary to, to what these guys did at this point, because it meant that they, they weren't like burning through their, their meager savings from day one. They were able to nearly zero out uh, their, their expenses. Um, and so, you know, at a, at a point when they were just getting off the ground trying to like uh, get any semblance of a game up and running, um, that, that was important, that they weren't like on a, on a ticking clock, you know, from day one. I'm a big um, I'm a big believer in luck. Um, I may not say it explicitly much in this talk, but I feel like uh, above all, we were very lucky at many of the uh, decision points that we came to, and with a lot of what happened. But um, I feel that luck was, you know, circumstance and luck were at the heart of how Supergiant Games started. You know, Amir grew up in this very same house, like playing Dungeons and Dragons and like Fallout and all kinds of different games. And, and he winds up in the same house, you know, uh, making his, uh, his, his first game on his own terms. Um, it, it's just a strange uh, set of circumstances, but, uh, you know, under those set of circumstances, try to make the most of it. There's a lot to do, um, but at the same time, uh, I feel like in, in this day, it's never been easier in, in a lot of respects to get up and running because you can use like off the shelf PCs and, you know, home DSL. Uh, things like Skype, uh, Google Docs, and whatever, like just to get up and running is, is relatively straightforward with a new studio when it's small. Um, to whatever extent, uh, Electronic Arts was an informal place. So this, uh, you know, Supergiant was even more so. It's just these two guys living and working here. Um, you know, they kept their, they kept their uh, ambitions very modest initially. It's like we, we had these ideas around what, what Bastion might be, but like they're just trying to get coming from making real-time strategy games, they're just trying to get like a character like moving on the screen, swinging a hammer or whatever. Like your narrative ambitions don't matter at all like until you can get, uh, you know, until you can get some kind of video game going. This is the best uh, photograph in this presentation, I warn you now, but um, this dog uh, does not believe in, in the prospects of super giant games, I think. Uh, you know, working from home had its upsides and its downsides for these guys. Um, you know, Gavin would like, his car would just like die every few weeks because he'd just like go for weeks without, you know, ever driving his car. Um, you know, these guys, I think they, they, uh, they loved what this place was able to do for them, but at the same time, they, uh, over time, they uh, started going a little, a little stir crazy and didn't, didn't want to uh, be in this place forever, but it was perfect for what they were trying to do at the time. A few months into development, this was Bastion. Um, this is like before the end of 2009. Um, so uh, if you look carefully and are familiar with uh, the game of Dungeons and Dragons, you'll notice all of these monsters are like stolen shamelessly from like the monstrous manual. And there's no artist on the project. It's just these guys prototyping gameplay. Uh, some of the early ideas from Bastion did actually like survive all the way through development from this point. Things like the world rising up around you and, and the feel of certain moves uh, from like the evasive roll to the hammer and so on. So they had they had something that like started to feel like a like a real video game, but you know it looked like this. This is not um, something to give to a polite company. So um, they were starting to get you know a little worried at this point. They realized uh, that they needed help. Like they could not make like a kind of a real game uh, on their own. So help arrived uh, in some unlikely forms. Uh, first uh, was this gentleman by name of Darren Korb a close friend of uh, Amir's from when, uh, from when they were uh, kids. Um, Darren is like a musician uh, by, uh, by background, and he would never worked on a game or anything like that, but uh, he uh, was good at the music making, and Darren, Darren asked him to uh, provide some music and do some sound effects and stuff like that. The other person who uh, started helping around this time is, is Logan Cunningham, who's a mutual friend of theirs, 
uh, from when they were like 10 years old, you know, playing soccer in middle school. Um, Logan uh, was like a, like a, he was like tearing movie ticket stubs in New York at the time, like a struggling actor. Um, he's an actor, uh, and he uh, and he ha happens to have a good voice. And uh, Amir asked him if he could uh, record a few lines because we did have uh, these thoughts about what the narr like we wanted this game to have narrative. We saw that as an opportunity in the action RPG genre, but we didn't want the narrative to like interrupt the play experience with walls of text, and we couldn't do cutscenes or anything like that. So uh, Amir one day is like, "Hey, maybe voiceover is the ticket." Added some voiceover to the game. And along with Darren's music, suddenly, um, you know, suddenly this game had like an atmosphere and a mood, um, and those are things that that we thought were important. Um, so they were finally getting somewhere. Um, you know, if you looked past the D and D art, you could start to feel something about the game. This is like early in uh, 20, 2010, I guess, at this point. Uh, and uh, they they worked with a number of different artists on like a contract basis, um, and the game, you know, really started to take shape at this point. Um, it was kind of incoherent still, but like it, uh, it, but you know, it started to look and feel like a real game. They, they were really onto something. This was around uh, GDC, I guess, of, of 2010. Um, but you know, at this point, they could have kept going, but they felt like something just wasn't quite right. Like this wasn't the look that they were totally happy with. So they kept struggling to find the right artist, and then they met uh, Gen Z uh, through a close uh, mutual friend. Um, and uh, Jen was working at a company called Gaia Online at the time, making free-to-play MMOs. And, and you like look at her Deviant Art page or whatever, and it's like, man, I, or I don't know what you think, but when I saw this stuff, I thought it was amazing. Um, I, I thought she, she was a rare talent, and uh, Amir and Gavin you know, started working with her. And uh, sure enough, you know, she uh, provides this look for the game that really, really like held up its end of the bargain and then some in comparison to whatever was going on with the audio it suddenly we had this like a storybook kind of the fantasy frontier world that, that you know existed thus far kind of only in our imaginations um, and finally you know fashion was starting to look like a real thing it was around this time that Amir got the news that uh, Bastion was accepted into the PAX 10 uh, which meant that uh, our game or their game at the time would be featured um, at, at the Penny Arcade Expo, they'd give you a table and give you a screen and you could show your game for free. And they had no money to do this kind of thing on their own, so this, this was a really big opportunity. At the point, the game was unannounced and like this was a chance to get out there and hopefully make a splash. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the guys really hauled ass at this point to like pull the game together and make it look like uh, pretty close to how it ended up finally looking. Um, this was also uh, another moment in my life where, uh, where I was faced with a choice because uh, 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 Amir and I had been talking and uh, the opportunity came up for me to reunite with this team. Uh, they're about to go into full production, uh, a, like a really key moment in, in this game's development. And um, so, you know, long story short, obviously I, I accepted, but um, convincing, you know, my family at the time, I just had a, my son was just born like two weeks prior to this, like, what would you say if I quit my good solid job at 2K Games and you know accepted a job with little prospects of success and started mooching off my parents for the first time since I was 17. Does that sound like a good career move at this time? But I, I said it less cynically than that and uh, <laughs> made a more sincere case and, and thankfully my family was very supportive and thankfully I had a family that I could um, frankly mooch off of for a period of time um, and so uh, obviously um, I signed on. Uh, they wanted me to work on the story of the game. That was something um, I was, I was uh, very excited about and always wanted to do. Um, and I contributed to level design as well. Um, but this is, this is me basically, you know, I joined right before we all piled into a van uh, and drove 17 hours to Seattle to show Bastion for the first time. Um, and then at PAX, you know, we had our screen and everything. Um, and PAX was just, I think, really one of the best experiences that any of us had ever had. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, the response that we got uh, to this game. Uh, so many people coming by and playing it. Like I, I had, I've been working in game development for several years at that point, but I'd actually never seen like people visibly show like joy at like playing a game I'd worked on. I, I, I'm the sort of person who just, I may be playing my favorite game ever. I'm still sitting there like stone faced or whatever. You could never tell that I like the thing. Um, but so, so I didn't know that people 
like emoted that way when they played games. So that was really remarkable. Uh, things that we thought would be pretty polarizing, like the use of narration, uh, were like, at least at PAX, they were like unanimously uh, well liked. So that was, um, you know, not only that, we started to meet these, these folks uh, in the uh, like small game development community that were, that we like, like frankly, in a lot of cases we like idolized and these guys are like giving us the time of day and giving us advice and stuff. It, it was just, it was just amazing. And then we went home and played Magic. Uh, and then um, we, you know, the, the drive was like really grueling, um, but I think it was like a really, you know, it's, it's the really good like sort of team bonding experience, especially someone like me. I, uh, I obviously knew uh, Amir and Gavin from a long time ago, but I'd never met uh, Darren and Jen at that point. Um, once we got back, there was much to do. Uh, you know, we had a whole game to make. We showed like the 20 minute opening at PAX, but um, everything else. Uh, was still to come. We went into full production mode and started building out the rest of the content. We had a really, we set a really good deadline for ourselves, which was the IGF uh, submission that was like a couple of months later. So we wanted to, you know, have like the first hour of the game or something like that ready for then. Um, and we also got a lot of interest from uh, potential publishers, uh, which we were we were interested in talking to them. Um, although the game was self-funded, uh, we needed a publisher in order to get onto Xbox Live Arcade, which was a platform we were very interested in at that time. Um, so that was, yeah, there was a lot of activity there. Um, but, you know, this was our team during the holidays of 2010, and we'd been, you know, been working, but ma making really good progress and feeling pretty good. Um, the one thing was, though, we wanted Bastion to come out on both console and PC, console first and foremost, and it was not yet running on console, so we needed help. That help uh, came in the form of this man, Andrew Wang, uh, who joined as our CTO. Um, Andrew had come from working on Modern Warfare 1 and 2, so it, uh, Bastion must have been like an interesting uh, change of pace um, going from games like that. Um, so the first few months of 2010 were super intense because we were done with the game around May, so we had to build all the content, getting, get it running on Xbox and all that stuff. Uh, we, were, uh, we were finalists in two IGF categories, so we got to go to the IGF and, and uh, GDC that year in, in 2011. That was a really amazing experience for us, getting to go to the awards and you know once again just be like immersed in this community that that we you know even working at EA like it, it still seemed like something we um, something that where the grass was greener on the other side uh, as in in that community. Another really key thing um, that I just remembered last night I want to mention here is like. We went to the team meet GDC talk, or I did, um, and uh, in it they they revealed you know how well Super Meat Boy had done uh, on Steam relative to Xbox Live Arcade, and like that that uh, significantly affected our own planning. Like at that point, we thought Bastion was like basically going to be a console. You know, we're making like a console style game, looks kind of like a JRPG or something like that. We thought people wouldn't really care on PC, and after but after this, we're like, hey, maybe PC is going to be a thing, and that uh, turned out to be the case. Um, we, uh, back to the publisher thing, so at this point uh, our conversations with a couple of folks were pretty far along, um, and uh, like I said, we, uh, despite self-funding, we, we needed a publisher at this point uh, since we wanted to be on console and we wanted to work with someone who was going to like stay out of our hair and let us, let us do our thing, like really believed in the game for what it was, um, and we, we found that partner in, in Warner Brothers in our case. Uh, we announced that partnership at PAX East a few weeks after um, um, after GDC, and um, they, you know, with Warner Brothers' help, uh, they we were able to have this presence at PAX East. Like we we could have never done this at this point in development because we were just we we're just busy making the whole game. Um, I don't think we would have gone to PAX East at all uh, if not for if not for that. Um, and but that turned out to be a really good show for us that helped uh, I think like raise a lot of awareness around the game. Um, and uh, then, you know, we just had to finish the thing. And this uh, came, you know, came the most intense period of Bastion's development. Notice, uh, I wanna make a point here, which is that I don't have, you, you know, all these photos I'm showing, it's like people smiling. I, I, I noticed that like, you, you take pictures of the good times. Like you don't take pictures of people like clutching their heads in despair at like four in the morning or whatever. So imagine there are a whole bunch of those that would go in this space, um, and, you know, we didn't, we took some video actually, but not, um, not a lot of photos. Uh, but yeah, these gaps in time is when like a, a lot of the real heavy lifting got done. And, um, uh, but you know, we, we somehow pulled it together. Uh, by the time we went to E3 uh, in, what was it, like Ju June or 
uh, yeah, it was June. Uh, the game was basically done and in, in submission. Um, and uh, Warner Brothers, once again, really kind of pulled out all this. We couldn't have gotten this kind of banner, you know, made for ourselves. Um, uh, it was uh, pretty, pretty remarkable. We got the news that we got into Summer of Arcade, which was like a huge, we were really stoked about that on the team because, again, these games like Braid and Castle Crashers were really our spiritual uh, influences. Um, so to follow in their footsteps in Summer of Arcade really meant a lot to us and, and also, you know, boded well, I think, for our prospects, like from, the, you know, honestly, commercially, because at this point we're, we're wondering what's going to, like, we're rapidly running out of our meager budget and we're like, well, if it's, whether or not this game sells will determine whether or not we continue on as a team and we wanted to continue on. But at the time we had a really good E3, a lot of people were telling us like, oh, you're going to, you know, oh, you're going to knock it out of the park, which is like, you don't is kind of like, I don't know, it, it was awkward hearing that before the thing was done. We're all very, not only superstitious, but I think we always kind of expect the worst um, and, and hope for the best. So um, we, we weren't sure what was going to happen. The game came out on July 20th on XBLA, sold about 35,000 copies or so in its first week, which was like, it was good, um, but not, uh, you know, compared to like Limbo or something the previous year, it's like a, a small fraction. So it's not, it's not like a grand slam home run or something like that, but certainly, um, it, you know, the reviews, the reviews are really good. The, the sales were solid and we're like, cool. This, uh, this was not a complete disaster, thankfully. Um, the game came out on PC uh, just three weeks later we were anxious to get the game out on PC for, for uh, a variety of reasons. Um, that launch went pretty smooth. It was great to be able to like rapidly update that version of the game and have like a much more direct um, conversation with, with uh, fans of the game. You know, they just, not just fans, but anyone who bought it and was having problems or something. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that was, that was intense. And then, you know, things started to sim simmer down. The game was out, the reviews had landed. Um, the you know the sales are starting to decline and, and we're just like I guess we should start uh, putting our lives back together or something like that. Um, we weren't quite sure what to make of what happened. Um, the excitement around the game before it came out was like huge, and and then you know and then we're just like we just weren't sure. It was like stuck in the middle of a whirlwind. Um, and so anyway, there was more work to be done, uh, although not quite as insanely as uh, leading up to the launch. Um, we did things like release uh, the soundtrack for the game. The soundtrack was like, of all the aspects of the game, the single most highly regarded part of Bastion uh, in, in like a really remarkable way. I feel like music is like such a subjective thing that someone's gotta, you know, someone's just gonna hate your music or whatever just cause. Um, but it seemed like everybody uh, loved, uh, loved the game's uh, soundtrack. So Darren and Logan uh, spent weeks like packaging and mailing CDs from Darren's apartment there. Um, Soon enough, another PAX rolled around um, in, in September. It was kind of a weird show. The game was out. We didn't have much of a crowd. Um, we're just like, we didn't want to like lose our spot there or whatever. Well, show up, uh, show our PC version, but um, it didn't have the same feel as the previous shows. And then we played Mansions of Madness, which is like way worse than magic. I don't know. Um, <sighs> The thing, okay, at least, not, not to sound uh, too down on ourselves, I mean, we, at, at this point it was becoming clear that like, hey, we survived, like we get, to, we get to stick around and do more stuff. So our next order of business was to find a new place to work because at this point, Gavin and Amir are like, love you man, but let's, let's you know, find a more reasonable living arrangement. Um, we wanted to be more centrally located in, in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, and Amir's dad was also like coming home. There was like a practical need to get the heck out of there. Um, so we needed to find, I don't know, something that felt right to us. And what we found uh, was this uh, strange little studio space in San Francisco. We didn't want anything too uh, office-y. Um, um, and you know, we used the first money that we got to buy this ridiculous fountain and then it was really awkward. So we put some plants next to it. <laughs> And then we just like turned it off because everyone like had to go pee all the time. It's just bubbling like it's like standing next to a waterfall. So that thing is still there. But anyway, we, we ironically bought a fountain. Uh, this place uh, had a very different vibe to it. Uh, we're, we're still there now, but um, it, it, obviously, like if you've ever been to suburban San Jose, this is pretty different, uh, but an interesting change of scenery that took some adjustment. Um, but more choices were at stake for us, um, especially uh, what to work on next. Now, uh, 
following Bastion's now you know, emerging success, um, we got some very exciting work for hire opportunities, actually, um, on, on franchises that we had a lot of respect for. And also, uh, you know, even though we designed Bastion as like a standalone experience that was supposed to be self-contained and might well be the last game we ever make and all that, um, it was meant to be the kind of world that could potentially support any number of stories. And uh, a, a common theme from, from people who like the game would be like, can't wait for the sequel. So like the idea of making a sequel is like an obvious, uh, potentially obvious direction. Um, so there was that. And of course, we could also just try uh, something new and with fewer resources, uh, resource constraints, you know, this time around the whole team there from day one, you know, whatever that game could be would be limited uh, largely by our own imaginations. And it was here that um, ideas for our next project, you know, really started uh, incubating. Uh, there were some conversations earlier, but really um, it was in the fall of, of, uh, of 2011 that, that we started figuring things out. Um, we got a lot of positive feedback around Bastion's vibe and atmosphere, and like having done this weird fantasy frontier world, we were just interested to find out what we could come up with if we did something in like the sci-fi vein. Like what would be our, if, we, if this was our take on fantasy, what would our take on science fiction be? And we were kind of in love with these looming, you know, science fiction cityscapes and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, as, as interesting as some of these opportunities were, when, when we came down to it, um, we realized that the thing that was the most important to us was, was maintaining our independence and making something from scratch again. Like we, we're like, we'd, we've done this once um, and it was awesome. And, and we fought so hard to get here and so many people, including people at like AAA studios would kill to be in this position. Why would we give this up? Why shouldn't we uh, try this again? And um, we, we realized we wanted to stick in the action RPG genre because Bastion in a lot of ways was like, we explored this genre in, in ways that were interesting to us and even having done that game, we felt that there are all these other places we could go, you know, that may not have made sense for Bastion, uh, but still, you know, within the, the framework of the action RPG were very interesting to us. So we started kicking around ideas there. Um, the, you know, the days took on a different kind of feel. Uh, we were working much more like normal hours at this point. One of the interesting advantages of working on like a really gnarly street in San Francisco is like, you don't want to stay there too late. As soon as the sun is setting, you're like, I, I better, I better go. Whereas at, in San Jose, you're like, yeah, I work all night, doesn't matter. Um, you know, and uh, obviously you can't complain like this is my, you know, this is my commute in the morning. Why I'm taking photos on the Golden Gate Bridge is for you to decide. Um, we had other choices at stake. Um, even though we were starting to kick around ideas on a new project, there were many uh, opportunities surrounding Bastion popping up. Um, it was a nice set of problems to have, honestly. Is like all these, it's like what uh, all the stuff that we could do with this game to like kind of make the most of it and um, uh, learn more and all sorts of different things. But it's a matter of deciding uh, what to focus on. One of the things we focused on was this weird new uh, Google initiative. We launched a version of Bastion that ran natively in the Chrome browser using um, a uh, using like a, uh, a Google uh, technology uh, called Native Client. Um, that that came up as as a thing that you know certainly we couldn't have planned for. And one day they're like, would, "Would you like to work with us on this new technology initiative?" And we're like, "All right, that sounds that sounds pretty interesting." Might for all we know, everyone's going to be playing games in their browsers in another couple of years. So um, it was like. Uh, a good uh, learning experience uh, all around, and our, our engineers you know, gained a lot of valuable insight out of it, and it uh, pushed our own uh, technology closer to where it has, uh, is currently. Um, another thing we did as a one-off, uh, late, late in uh, 2012, we released like a one-off DLC thing. It was free on PC and cost a buck on XBLA. Um, as sort of a thank you for fans, uh, we wanted to see if we could do DLC in a way that didn't like try to continue the story because the game has a very kind of conclusive ending. We, uh, and we found a way to do it and that was a cool experience and it, it launched uh, right around the time there was like a big uh, winter sale for Steam and um, uh, you know that uh, basically it helped the game continue to do well. Uh, the game turned out to have much uh, longer legs than we thought possible for like a single player only game. This here is uh, Mr. Michael Aleshy, uh who is the first person we hired after Bastion was released. Uh, he is our office manager. We needed someone to like keep the lights on at the studio basically. Is, is suddenly we were, there was more uh, upkeep than there used to be. We had um, 
uh, you know, we had bills to pay and things like that. Um, and he was able to let us uh, focus on, uh, on, on game development while, while handling a lot of that stuff for us. Um, he also uh, managed uh, the online store that we launched. Uh, another thing we wanted to try, this was our period of, you know, try everything once. We're like, hey, you know, people are asking, the soundtrack has done really well, let's, let's try a t-shirt, let's try an art print. This is stuff that people were actually asking us for and made like way more sense than like, you know, paid DLC or something for our game. Um, and we designed all those items ourselves and it was cool to like, working in the realm of making digital games, it was great to like make like physical goods and send them to people you know, right from our studio with like handwritten notes and stuff like that and people, you know, seemed to go really well. Um, we had to think a lot about our growth as a studio. Suddenly, you know, we had some money like for the first time ever and we were like, hey, we could grow, we could hire people. And like none of us wanted to just hire people because um, so much of what we had we felt is, is like the chemistry of the people on the team where even if you bring in really good people, uh, that chemistry might change in unexpected ways. So we're super careful and leery uh, of who uh, of who joins us and make you know it's, it just needs to be the right fit. Um, that said, we identified like weaknesses on our team. We felt that we were like an incomplete team on Bastion. We had to shore up our weaknesses with, uh, by calling in favors for friends uh, who didn't work for us who had other jobs. Um, so you know we had to kind of reconcile how we felt about that stuff. Um, by the end of 2011, uh, to our I guess to our surprise, Bastion had won over 100 awards and sold more than 500,000 copies. Um, it, so it, it, I think this was the point where for us, it really started to sink in that this game actually was a success. Uh, so many games, you know, they, whatever, they have their sales in their first week, then they're off the radar, and for whatever reason, again, uh, luck, circumstance, uh, I'm sure I, th I thank those things, thank my family, thank the Academy, you know, they, uh, th those may have had something to do with it, but Bastion did not fall off the radar, um, and it kept going. So um, this was our, suddenly, you know, it's our little moment in the sun, and, you know, we get to go to, go to GDC, the GDC awards, this time we won something, um, Amir's getting invited to speak in Melbourne, Australia, and China, and Montreal, um, this is a cool slide, this is a slide about the movie Sunshine, uh, or quoting the movie Sunshine, expressing uh, uh, something similar to our development process where, um, you probably can't read it. It's about, uh, yeah, our, our process is not a, a democratic one. Um, the person who has to do the work uh, is the person who will make the decision about the work. Uh, so, you know, Jen, as the artist, will decide uh, what happens in terms of the art and stuff like that, the, you know, the writing and so on is my responsibility and so on and so forth. Uh, we seek uh, kind of commun uh, we, we seek unanimous decision as much as possible, but in the end, the, the buck stops with the, with the person responsible for the stuff. Uh, Darren gave a GDC talk that was like one of the highest rated uh, GDC talks that year about how he did all the audio. I, get to, I got to do a GDC talk where I got to put up a dark crystal slide in front of hundreds of people. Um, and then, you know, then there's another PAX East. This time the difference was we had Michael. We did the show entirely ourselves. This is our like biggest kind of show production. We wanted to gain that discipline ourselves because again, we'd had a great experiences at PAX thus far. Um, this is the first time we like sold our own uh, merchandise and stuff like that at PAX because you could do that. And to our, you know, to our amazement, the show uh, basically paid for itself um, in, in that, in, in what we made there. And people are more than happy to get the stuff. Um, we showed our ugly, you know, D&D prototype alongside the finished game. That was pretty fun and went over well. We got our, like, first cosplayers. I was like, what the, oh, man. Um, it was, uh, I mean, it was, hey, it was awesome. Um, but um, it was a weird time. We were still doing a lot of stuff with Bastion. Um, we were trying to get it onto more platforms. Um, because, again, these opportunities kept coming up. Like, we were talking to the Humble Bundle people at this point, uh, and we were also really interested in potentially getting it on the iPad, which we told no one about, but over the holidays we got ourselves iPads and like for all we know, people are only gonna be playing games on touch devices. We better see what this thing is all about unless lest, uh, the future you know, leave us in the dust. Um, so we realized we needed a little more engineering firepower, so, uh, and we met just the guy who is uh, Mr. Chris Journey, joined us from Double Fine. He had previously worked at Relic on games like Company of Heroes, which we were huge fans of. Uh, so he was able to help us, uh, you know, 
uh, get the game onto onto more platforms. We launched on on a, a Mac native version in April, uh, and then uh, we were in the humble bundle with a Linux native version uh, in May, um, and you know then shortly after was uh, in the summer was our one year anniversary, and at that point Bastion had sold 1.3 million copies, including uh, humble bundle sales. Um, you know c in comparison to that first slow week is like we, we were just kind of. Uh, beside ourselves, uh, much much greater than our most optimistic uh, estimates before the game came out. Um, but you know, despite the revelry, I remember feeling really anxious at this point in time. Um, we had been working on this iPad version of the game for weeks and then months, and and it was it was just it was just bad, like for a long time, because we we were uh, we weren't going to release it if it was bad, but we had to make a lot of changes to it. Um, in order to make it not bad, and it seemed, you know, we were willing to spend as much time as we needed in order to do that, but it was the first time that we were working on something that, that really felt like it had no end in sight. Um, and um, so we're like, okay, what's going on with this thing? Like, what do we do? And we gave ourselves an arbitrary drop dead date, which was uh, Andrew, uh, our CTO, he, he had a wedding coming up in August, we're like, and he was heavily involved in the engineering, and it's like, you know what? We're just gonna, we'll have like a do or die decision before his wedding. Um, we had a lot of concerns. We, you know, listed all that stuff out. And in the end, it, you know, we were able to solve those things. Um, and, and even though it took six months, um, this version of the game came out in August of 2012. And, um, uh, you know, we, we gutted the game from an engineering standpoint and, and like retuned redesigned huge aspects of the game. We were, had no idea how people were gonna take it, but it did really, really well. Uh, and um, we recouped uh, all, all the kind of money that we poured into that version in, in, in about like a week. Um, so that was a, that was a big relief. Um, we went to, uh, oh, another thing I should mention is that was the first time we had split our team. Like we had a lot of our team uh, doing pre-production on our next project and then uh, and then the other half was on iPad for a long time. And then toward the end of iPad, we all dogpiled onto the iPad version just to get it done. And that's when it felt like momentum really uh, came back. Uh, we got the spring back in our step, as it were. Um, so, because pre pre-production on, on our next game was actually going pretty slow. Another PAX came around, PAX Prime. Uh, we let people play the iPad version, um, get their hands on it for the first time. It was actually really cool to see uh, that, you know, we, we, we had always liked the idea of making a game that like anyone could play, anyone could like pick up a controller, could start playing Bastion, and this version was like, I think, in a lot of ways, the ultimate expression of that. Like, you know, these guys who probably never held a, an Xbox controller or something like that were able to pick it right up. Um, by this point, PAX had a pretty different feel. Like, we had like fans. It was just like uh, people expressing their love of Bastion in ways that were uh, pretty, um, pretty surprising to us. Uh, it made me and I think all of us probably all the more anxious to like make something new. It was now more than a year uh, since we had released Bastion and we'd still largely been working on Bastion. Uh, we couldn't resist though. Um, you know, we made a, like the iPad version was doing so well. Hey, all these people begging for an I iPhone version. Well, that's not gonna take too much more effort. Let's just do that. The iPhone 5 just got announced. We made that version of the game. That was cool. Um, and these opportunities were still there. Like, hey, make Bastion for the for the Vita, make Bastion for the PS3, make Bastion for Android. Um, and again, these are these are first world problems, absolutely. But but as a team, we we were, uh, you know, we, we felt very strongly that each version of the game that we make needs to be as good or better than than the previous versions. Um, and and but at this point in time, we're like. We don't want to just port it. We want to like learn something, do something new every time uh, we we make a version of this game. And and we we didn't the studio like wasn't created just to make Bastion. Like we want to do more stuff. So we're like, okay, that's it. Uh, now everyone is on the new project. And this is in the fall of of 2012. All right, we couldn't resist. Uh, Amir and I had obsessively been playing Dota 2 for much of this year as we were calming down for making Bastion and made this uh, announcer pack as sort of a fan thing for Dota 2 and that like, that was uh, actually pretty popular. It was a lot of fun to do. It was like a fit, it, we recorded hundreds and hundreds of lines of our Bastion narrator saying things about Dota 2. It was surprisingly fun. Um, 
Yeah, so we had a very Bastion Christmas, but um, at this point, we're like, okay, that's it. The line in the sand is drawn, and uh, we're all onto something new. Switching gears was tricky. Uh, we had, on the plus side, we had a full team from day one. All these, uh, you know, really good opinions, uh, good ideas from, from many more people. On the minus side, many good ideas, many smart people all conversing. So I think we, we, we had fewer constraints. Um, so uh, we, you know, we had to like, I think the, the decisions that we made, we, we needled even, even kind of harder than, than we did on Bastion. Um, the thing that we were interested in um, was, uh, I mentioned previously, uh, exploring this genre in new directions, not only uh, not only kind of thematically and in the world design, but but uh, we we wanted to capture this the the feel of uh, classic turn-based strategy games and tactical games in like an action RPG context. We felt that there was something rich there, um, and uh, that's that's kind of where we were prototyping. Um, but you know, we churned through a lot of ideas. Um, again, the fewer constraints and. And uh, the the uh, the more people uh, involved um, made it made it tougher in some ways, and especially you know we felt like we had we had some big shoes to fill. Um, at the same time, we didn't uh, just you know even though we had more people, uh, our our process is not necessarily uh, to include everyone in every decision. That's the way that we preserve uh, the the culture that we have um, and and the the development environment that we have. It's it's sort of a need to know basis uh, and trust based uh, system, I would say, where um, the, the people directly involved, you know, everyone can give feedback on everything at all points, but when it comes down um, to the, um, to really deciding uh, certain aspects of the game, it's the people who will have to do the work uh, who uh, ultimately get say. Um, in the end, uh, certain ideas uh, survived uh, this uh, relatively long pre-production process. The ideas for our protagonist character for this game dated actually all the way back to a drive coming, returning from E3 the previous year before Bastion had even come out. Um, we tried like a lot of different things uh, in the process, but ended up coming back to that idea. Uh, and, and even even like the, the, the name of the games, like the, the, the moment uh, I saw this uh, early uh, painting of the, the character uh, that Jen did, as like, like the transistor name just like popped. It came, it came in a flash. Um, we considered many names, and that was, you know, like, like other things, that was the one that stuck. By the fall of uh, 2012, you know, we had a good sense for where we were going with this game finally, but we needed to start, like, building it for real. We'd just been prototyping. That's where this man came in. His name is uh, Camilo Vanegas, uh, and uh, he brought our studio to 10 people. Uh, we had good luck hiring people with no previous industry experience, and Camilo is another example of that. Uh, he joined us as a 3D artist and animator. Um, and uh, he previously, uh, we, you know, anytime we'd need an animation, we would have to call in a favor on Bastion, and that was not something um, that we felt, you know, w we could continue doing indefinitely, um, and felt like we could just get a lot more iteration time and get to better quality if we uh, had this kind of uh, kind of guy in house. And even though um, uh, we're still like our games are entirely 2D, we use uh, 3D modeling and animation to like then render out into thousands of frames of animation that would not be reasonable for a person to hand draw. Um, so uh, what, uh, what really struck us about Camilo was that he had like a, we felt a rare talent for uh, being able to take Jen's uh, 2D uh, painted artwork and, and translate it into 3D without kind of losing the, uh, the, the look and feel of it. I, as, as a long time game player, I feel like 3D and 2D and can feel really kind of different. Um, and we really wanted it to feel 2D, and Camilo uh, brought that to our team. And here's me being a terrible dad over the holidays in 2012. I'm like playing Persona 4 or something like that. That's my son Isaac, and, and uh, I'm just like worrying about what the hell we're gonna do about this game. Because we're thinking about announcing it at PAX East, but, but even though we've been prototyping for a long time and building versions of the game, we just keep sort of uh, redoing a lot of things. So the first few months of 2013 uh, were by far our busiest uh, since uh, that time, just before Bastion launched, since when we were finaling Bastion. We wanted to reveal the game at PAX, but we had a really long way to go just to pull a lot of things together. Uh, we, we really, you know, we were play test testing the game pretty heavily at this point. 
Um, but that's not the same as announcing it and letting hundreds of people play it at PAX. And like we got, we got all sorts of different feedback and we just had a lot of concerns on team. The days before PAX were like super scary, honestly. We'd never announced a second game before. And you know, people, different people on the team had different feelings about it. So we, uh, we had like an 11th hour, we weren't even sure that we were gonna, we, we like came to the point when we thought we were gonna announce it, but, but we started to get cold feet. Like we weren't sure if we were really ready. Um, but we, um, you know, we pulled ourselves together and we're like, look, if we took another six months, like we'll, we'll like polish this or something, but like there, there aren't enough things that we would change about this. Like we, if, if, if we, this is the point in time where we need to know what people at large think about this, because that would be very informative to what we do from here. So we, we pulled the trigger, we showed up at PAX East, we announced Transistor on March 19th or something like that and had it playable. Uh, you know, a couple of days later, similar to what we did with Bastion. Uh, and man, that show was crazy. Uh, it was by far our biggest show ever, and people waited for like uh, two or three hours to play our game, even though we brought like tons of stations for people to play on. But above all, we were just incredibly relieved uh, by the response um, that we got. Um, among the people who played the game at PAX, who did not have to wait two hours, was this gentleman. Uh, Adam Boys from Sony. And the, he and the Sony team uh, really liked what they played at the game, and uh, they said they wanted to see it on PS4. We started talking to them, and you know, much like with Bastion, we wanted Transistor to be on uh, both console and PC. And uh, they invited us to go to E3 with them, and we're like, oh, no thanks. They're like that's cool. E E3 we felt you know it was a show kind of for the big guys, um, and PAX was more our speed. But then we thought about it more. Uh, thought about maybe uh, we could swing it in a way that wouldn't be super disruptive to our schedule, you, you know, not have to make a whole new build and all that. We just wanted to like have uninterrupted time working on the game at this point. Uh, but, but at the same time, E3 increasingly looked like an interesting opportunity and we found ways to, um, to make it work. So we showed up um, and uh, we found ourselves in LA in uh, July or something like that. And they, there's tiny little me and tiny little Amir on this giant stage because um, Sony has been on this you know, really values uh, these smaller independent developers. They really put, uh, uh, we were surprised to find ourselves here, needless to say, I guess. Uh, you know, just a couple of years prior, we had our tiny little table at PAX and here we are on this giant stage. So uh, if you think that feels surreal, you were right. Uh, being, you know, right across, having like a booth right across from like Ubisoft's watchdogs or whatever, D3 is just crazy. Um, it was another busy and exciting show, um, but we were anxious to just get back and, uh, and make our video game. Uh, E3 was like a sort of an unplanned uh, distraction. So once we got back, uh, after all the angst, you know, going into PAX East, uh, the, the, the mood on the team, I think, improved a lot. Um, there were a lot of things that we wanted to improve and change and kind of tweak uh, based on what we'd seen people play and how, like having had a little time and distance from what we showed at PAX, we did those things. Um, so by the time we went into PAX Prime, just a couple of weeks ago here, uh, I think the mood uh, was was a lot better, um, and you know at this point we're we're used to going to these shows and and we love it. I mean, you, you love talking to the people who whose lives somehow have been like positively impacted in some cases by a game that we made. That's like makes it all. It's a an important reminder about what we're doing, and it's nice to kind of feel really weird at these shows. Also, uh, that never ceases to be amazing, and and also just watching hundreds of people play your video game is incredibly. Uh, useful. Uh, and then we go home and get back to work and stop taking photos. Um, so our studio recently celebrated its four-year anniversary. All our focus now is on our next game. We're in full production, just know where it's going and just building it all out. At this point, Bastion has sold more than 2.2 million copies, which is like, all right, that's, I guess. Uh, uh, you know, we're still at the studio on Shipley Street in San Francisco. We're thinking about moving back to a house. Uh, our lease is coming up soon, but I, I hope we get to finish out the project in this space because uh, it, it feels, uh, you know, the setting I think is sort of tied uh, to the game that we're making. And as for the game, you know, it's much like Bastion, it, it, we're really, uh, everything is riding on this game for us. Um, it, it's like the the way, all the things that, that worked about how we made Bastion were, to the extent that we could continue 
th that same process, uh, we, we are doing that on this game um, just because it's worked out so well for us. And the most important thing for us is just to keep the team together uh, for as long as possible and, and work on stuff that we, we can all feel good about and hopefully you know people who play it uh, feel good about it too. Uh, we know that doesn't guarantee uh, anything for the future uh, and, and you know, much like in choose your own adventure books or whatever, it's like you never know when your number is going to come up. But uh, thus far, it's been uh, it's been really fun coming up on these decision points and, and getting to make those choices uh, together and and you know move forward with those decisions and not look back and kind of make the most of it until the next weird unexpected decision comes up. One of the things that's changed for us is like Bastion. We really burn uh, kind of burn the candle at both ends. Um, it was it was our big chance to make something worth a damn. But since we want to be in this for the long haul, like we had to get on, find a way to like get on with our lives and like repair our lives in addition to doing the stuff that we do. So that you know, and I feel like we've been able to do that to a certain extent. That's Andrew and his wife Vivian. They celebrated um, their second anniversary this uh, this past August. Uh, this is uh, Logan officiating uh, Darren's uh, marriage to uh, to his wife uh, Michelle. Uh, if you look closely, that is the Dungeons and Dragons uh, player's handbook that he's reading from. So it runs deep in our studio. Um, and 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 uh, and Amir just this uh, past week uh, married his longtime girlfriend Anna, uh, who uh, I've known as long uh, as I've known Amir, and she's kind of supported him through thick and thin and good times and bad all through this stuff. So you know, there's. Uh, a lot, a lot, I think, has happened to us, and and uh, and yet we've only made this one game so far. And so our hope, I think, is that we do get to stick it out for the long haul. Like, like some of our favorite bands, you, these bands have been around for like decades, and that's an amazing idea. You don't hear about game developers that get to stick together for that long. I think that's our kind of uh, fantasy around this stuff. So I hope our story uh, is only beginning, and I'm, I'll be curious to find out. So that's uh, what I've got, and a few minutes for questions if you guys have any. Thank you very much. Oh, and.